Today is the last Sunday of 2019. And it's been such a wonderful year filled with all kinds of different things, but above all, uh, the grace that we sang about. The title of the message today is Do Not Let Your Heart Be Troubled. Uh, taken straight from the scripture that we read, as we think about uh, just going through Christmas, and uh, one of the things that I want to emphasize today, I'm going to do it over and over again, is this one thing here. We're going to go from the helpless little baby in the manger to the powerful God and Savior who came for us. Because too often we think about Christmas, we spend a lot of time focusing on a manger and a little baby in that manger. And we never think of him as growing up. Well, he grew up to be God and Savior uh, to all of us. And we're going to try to keep that in focus as we go through this message. In your bulletin, there's an outline if you'd like to follow along. I wrote, do not let your heart be troubled. That's an interesting opening line. But this particular line here shows us the heart of Jesus and his compassion towards mankind. I don't know about you, but uh, I've gone through enough situations where you begin to hear things that are happening, and uh, all of a sudden it becomes to the, gets to the place that if it's sad news and bad news, it becomes overwhelming. You say, you know what, I don't want to hear anymore. Right? You go to the hospital, and the doctor starts talking to you, and they start listing different things. It's just like either you say, I don't want to hear anymore, or you shut down. Right? They're talking, but all you hear is you know, bumble, mumble, mumble, mumble. You don't hear anything else because it's so difficult to hear. And uh, so this is exactly what's happening here. Jesus is, uh, has been with his disciples for three years. He's been warning them about his purpose here on earth, and uh, he shared several things. And they were getting to be a little overwhelmed. And he wanted to encourage them with these words, do not let your heart be troubled. Maybe you've gone through a very difficult year. And maybe a lot of things have happened. And maybe you were overwhelmed. And maybe looking into the next year and the next decade doesn't seem too bright either. And God wants to say to you, do not let your heart be troubled. Because he is with you. So I want to read several verses here to give you a context where this particular text is coming from. So when you think about Jesus and his disciples, they've been together for a good three years. And that concept of discipling is the disciples practically lived with the master 24-7. So they, get, they develop a very deep bond together. So even as we think about the, the holidays and as we think about family that have gathered together, when the time comes to say goodbye, sometimes those goodbyes can be very difficult. Unless you have difficult family members, you're happy they're going. But uh, none of you have those family members. So they develop this deep bond, and all of a sudden, Jesus is really telling them, He's going to leave, and they don't quite know how to take it. So Jesus, in John 13, 30, 30, uh, 33, begins to tech, talk about his departure. Verse 33 says, little children, and again, even at that particular statement, his tenderness towards his disciples, little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. And just think about it for a second. Where I am going, you cannot come. They've been going with Jesus everywhere. All of a sudden, Jesus is saying, where I'm going, you cannot come. And obviously, Jesus is talking about his departure and his death. In John chapter 12, verse 32 and 33, uh, he's, he's going to start talking about his difficult death, his painful death. Verse 32 says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. So they knew when he said, 
that he was going to be lifted up. I don't know if you've seen how the crucifixion happens, right? They nail you on the ground first, and then they raise the beam up. And that's the concept of if I be lifted up, they knew it was going to be a crucifixion, and that's a very painful death. And I want you to think about your family member or your best friend, if they were going through a situation that is so difficult how you would feel. And then Jesus, in, uh, in Mark 14, 27, begins to talk about the fact that the disciples will abandon him. And Mark 14, 27 says, And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep, shall be scattered. I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And in John 13, 37 and 38, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not, uh, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Now, Jesus is talking about his departure. He's talking about the abandonment. And he's talking to Peter here saying, not only you will abandon me, but you will deny me three times. And in John 13, verse 21, Jesus' own broken, uh, brokenness is beginning to affect them. It says, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit. And I don't know about you, but when I meet with my leadership and I'm sharing with them some of the things that I'm going through, they can feel my pain. And there's a sense of feeling my brokenness. And these people, these disciples that have been with Jesus these three years, as they're hearing these things, the fact that Jesus became troubled in spirit, recognizing there's a painful death ahead, it affected them. Because again, I want, to, I want to remind us, even Jesus, not that he was doubting, not that he was afraid, there was just a sense that this is serious. And this is where, again, we think about sin, and sometimes we don't think about sin seriously enough. But Jesus knew that he had to die for the sin of mankind. When you're going through a difficult time, it's okay to feel sadness. It's okay to feel grief. It's okay to verbalize that. It's okay to cry. It's okay to recognize that, yeah, this, is, this has been a difficult time. Yet trusting that God will watch over you and God will guide and direct you, even as the scripture tells us, when you walk to the valley of the shadow of death, he will be there. When you are in the lion's den, he will be there. When you are in the midst of waters, he'll be there. He will always be there. But that doesn't mean we don't go through difficult times. And then Jesus started talking about the infamous betrayal in John 13, 21, the second part of it. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. Imagine 12 disciples so close to Jesus, and he says, One of you will betray me. And they began to think, you know, who is it? Who could it be? And that began to affect them as well. They all began to ask, is that you? Is that me? And then Jesus told them about this lonely road to the cross. In John 13, 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. You cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. So Jesus is going through all these things here, and his disciples, again, to the place where they, I think, a little bit overwhelmed. And then Jesus starts with uh, chapter four, uh, 14 and 15 and 16, all part of encouraging them. In the midst of all that's going to happen, he's going to encourage them. And this is why he says to them, do not let your heart be troubled. So the first thing we have here in, in chapter 14, verse 1, is this. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Now, this is not a suggestion. This is an imperative. 
He's saying, you believe in God, believe also in me. This is one of those areas, again, where Jesus is comparing himself with God because he is God. Okay, And he's, he, he wants them to trust him as the person that he is, God himself. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then he begins to talk to them about the reality of heaven. And when I do funerals, almost every single funeral, I ask this question, is heaven a real place? Or is it only a comforting coping mechanism to help us deal with death? Right? In other words, is heaven just that place of comfort, just a word comforts you? And somebody passes away in your family, you say, well, they are in a better place. They are in heaven. And my challenge in all these messages in, in funerals is the fact that you need to ask yourself the question, are they in a better place? How do you know for sure? Because if heaven is a real place, then that means we need to be able to get there. How do we get there? It's not this magical thing that happens. Jesus came so that we can get to heaven. And so we need to be very mindful that if there's a heaven, which we believe there is, there's also a hell because the Bible talks about hell. The same Bible that takes, talks about heaven talks about hell. And we need to get to that place of recognizing that heaven is not only a comforting coping mechanism, but it's a real place because Jesus says in verse 2 of chapter 14, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so... I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. So my father's house, the dwelling places, and a place for you. This is heaven. Our opportunity to be with God where he is. And so we need to begin to focus our attention on how are we living our lives. And I'm going to try to bring that message through this particular text that we need to be thinking about this more deliberately. Because I think too many of us have gotten so comfortable with quote-unquote religion, God, that we think that we're just going to go through life. We, we don't pay any attention to what God is saying. We do whatever we want, but we believe in the end, everybody is going to go to heaven. And I want to just hopefully remind you that that's not the case. Jesus came for a purpose, and we'll talk about that in a second. John chapter 14, verse 3. Everything hangs on this statement. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, pay close attention to this verse here. If I go and prepare a place for you, which he did, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so the point of the message today is I'm going to sort of recap a little bit about the first Advent that we celebrated through Christmas, and then I'm going to remind us of the second Advent and how we need to be preparing for it. So the first advent is Christmas. Jesus was prophesied that he would come uh, to this earth. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. That was prophesied that this little baby was going to become God, and he's going to become the savior of the world. He's going to be able to bring us peace. Now, oftentimes, again, I go back to this little baby in the manger. Uh, if you've had children, you, wa 